Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today for our special webinar looking at the impact to mobility and immigration issues that the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is having, and some of the issues that we're seeing being formed around the ever changing landscapes that are happening. Slide two, Emma. Following the proposals announced by Boris Johnson on the humanitarian sponsorship concept that could allow businesses to sponsor refugees, as well as key visa rule changes for Ukrainian family members, we wanted to consider what these policies could actually mean in practice and how businesses could get involved. David Morgan of our employment team will also discuss what HR can do to help employees who may be suffering from anxiety and mental health issues and advise on how employers can support employees through these difficult times. Ukrainian nationals are visa nationals and the Home Office is maintaining this requirement citing security concerns. Given the effect of the carrier's liability legislation, this means that all Ukrainian nationals are not able to travel to the UK without first having obtained a visa, for which they will need to travel to a neighbouring country in order to attend a visa application centre in order to give biometrics. And it is against this background that we look at the Ukrainian family scheme and a potential humanitarian programme, which is ever even more pertinent given the position regarding the evacuation corridors reported this morning. Slide four. So the Home Office opened the new Ukraine family scheme route on Friday, uh, 4th of March, and the route permits eligible applicants to join their UK-based family member in the United Kingdom free of charge. To be eligible under the route, the applicant must be applying to join or accompany their UK-based family member, known as a sponsor, be Ukrainian or the immediate family member of a Ukrainian national who is applying under the route, and have been, been residing and can produce evidence of being habitually resident in Ukraine prior to the 1st of January 22, including those who have now left Ukraine having fled to neighbouring countries. All applications will be subject to security checks, which, as I said, the UK government is maintaining. The UK-based sponsor must be a British citizen or be settled in the UK, i.e. holding indefinite leave to remain or settled status. Someone who holds pre-settled status in the UK under the EUSS scheme being the European Settlement Programme of the Immigration Rules and started living in the UK before the 1st of January 2021, or someone with refugee status or humanitarian protection in the UK. As such, the only type of limited leave that the UK-based sponsor can have is pre-settled status under the EUSS. Family members of Ukrainian nationals with limited leave to enter and remain in the United Kingdom, such as a Ukrainian national with leave as a skilled worker, will not meet the current eligibility requirements. Slide five. The situation regarding family relations, as you all know, has come under much criticism. Um, but Ukrainians will have to provide evidence that they are the immediate or the extended family member or an immediate family member of an extended family member and provide evidence confirming the relationship to the UK sponsor. Immediate family members are defined as a spouse or civil partner or an unmarried partner, provided that the couple have cohabited for at least two years or be a fiancé of the UK-based sponsor a child under the age of 18, or the parent of a child under the age of 18. Extended family members is a confusing definition, um, but what we do have in the policy is that those who are a parent, a child who's over 18, a grandparent, a grandchild, or a sibling will qualify. And yesterday, we saw extensions being granted to the extended family member route to thankfully include aunts and uncles, nephews and nieces, cousins, and also in-laws of those family members. The immediate family members of extended family members are also included in the programme, that being the spouse of an extended family member, provided that the relationship started before the 1st of January 22, a child under the age of 18, the parent of a child, 
or the fiancé or proposed civil partner. The programme um, has um, indicated that other family members will be considered where there are exceptional circumstances um, suggested to be a meaningful connection with the immediate family unit, their sponsor and the UK. Applications, as we know, must be made from outside the United Kingdom, applying online with biometric appointments being booked at one of the visa centres, which has been subject to much criticism in the media um, this past week. And it, as of this morning, it remains that the UK visa centres in Ukraine are suspended with temporary visa centres in Poland, Hungary, Moldova, Romania and Paris. And of course, the much reported position in Cali is still to be resolved. Successful applicants will be granted leave uh, for a period of three years and the grant of leave will permit employment and study in the UK and there will be no condition prohibiting access to public funds. The route is currently operating as a concession out with the immigration rules, but it is um, anticipated that the concession will be incorporated into um, the rules by emergency legislation on the 15th of March. And lastly, to touch on the position of Ukrainian nationals who are already in the United Kingdom. On the 24th of February, a temporary visa concession was introduced for Ukrainian nationals who are currently in the UK permitting those on the visitor visas to switch into a points-based system or a family route um, from within the UK with, and also a visa extension for seasonal workers to have their permission extended until the end of the year. Media reports over the weekend indicated that there had only been 50 visa applications actually granted. The Home Office responded on Monday, uh, this Monday at 4 p.m. releasing statistics reporting that there were just under 18,000 open applications, of which almost 9,000 were classed as submitted, with 4,300 appointments confirmed. Um, but it stood as of yesterday that only some 300 visas had actually been issued. This morning it is reported that the number of visas has increased to 780. Arguably, it remains a cumbersome, uh, chaotic and bureaucratic response to the crisis and certainly far removed from the government's statement that no country in Europe has done more to resettle vulnerable people since 2015, and that the UK were leading the world in terms of humanitarian response. More definitely needs to be done and quickly. And um, the Immigration Law Practitioners Association in London is giving evidence this morning to the Home Affairs Select Committee on the position thus far of the Home Office policy on refugees, so we await further announcements this week. Slide six. So that's where matters currently stand with the programme and I'll now pass you over to Jamie Kerr to look at the potential of humanitarian sponsorship. Thanks for that, Grace. That, that was useful um, on the, the family side. I'm um, going to speak about humanitarian sponsorship and, and there's been a lot of confusion over um, what the concept actually is and, and what it means and, and what it means for, for businesses. Um, I'm speaking to you this morning from home in Kerfin, um, just outside Motherwell in, in Lanarkshire. And Kerfin is supposed a place that would traditionally be associated with Irish, uh, high levels of Irish uh, immigration, but, it, but it's not well known that um, in Kerfin, there's a there's an existing monument to Ukrainian refugees at the at the grotto in Kerfin. So the refugee issue that that we're seeing from uh, the the Ukraine is not the first one that we've seen in in Scotland. I think the monument to Ukrainian refugees at Kerfin Grotto is maybe about forty or fifty years old, and it, it reflects the first wave of Ukrainian refugees that Scotland welcomed in the the late nineteen forties. Um, after the kind of Soviet famine um, in the, the Ukraine and, and the associated issues with it. And I think that's worth mentioning because um, we opened our doors to refugees from the Ukraine then and the Ukrainian community in Scotland's a very established one. In Leith, there's the well-established Ukrainian church, which at the moment has become a, a hub for supporting humanitarian Efforts. And I suppose now we as a Civic, Civic Scotland, Civic Britain, 
and the business community are called upon to act again. And one of the questions that we're receiving a lot is from clients is questions asking what, what can be done to, to help. And in terms of, of, of our team and, and, and our background, for those of you who don't know us, most of the, of the team started life as refugee lawyers. Um, these days we do mostly corporate um, business immigration support, and that's what we support many, if not most of you, with in terms of recruiting staff and, and dealing with skill shortages. But the, the best part of my professional career, I started as a, as a refugee lawyer. Um, um, therefore, uh, as a team, we've, we've dealt with the refugee issue um, before across um, a number of years and across a number of countries. And, and what's interesting and something that we'll touch on as we go through the, the rest of the sessions, how different the response to the Ukraine has, has been compared to other um, refugee um, challenges, the crisis that we've seen over the last couple of years, even, even recently. So if we move on to the, the, the next of my slides, the starting point for speaking about this humanitarian sponsorship concept comes from an announcement the Prime Minister made in uh, Poland um, on, on the 1st of March when, when he was visiting there. And uh, he said, and the quote's on the slide, but he, he said, we're going to have a humanitarian scheme and then a scheme by which UK companies and citizens can sponsor individual Ukrainians to come to the UK. So that's a really interesting um, approach. It's a very new approach. It's, it's not an approach that the UK has ever adopted in terms of refugee law or refugee um, policy. The, the UK has um, taken refugees um, through an organised method before, so Kosovo, Syria, have been the, the two um, most obvious examples for that. Refugees from every other conflict, but have never had an organised scheme for. And, and those of you who, who follow, the, um, I suppose, follow politics will see that one of the main issues in the last couple of months has been an immigration issue around the, the question of whether people entering the UK unlawfully should be criminalised. That's been the big political debate in, in the arena of home affairs in the last um, six months or so. Um, and the UK have traditionally not reached out to pick up refugees from conflict zones, with, as I say, the two exceptions really being Syria and, um, and Kosovo. Usually when we deal with refugees, it's, it's left for them to arrive in the UK and, and then be processed through the asylum system. So this statement from the Prime Minister, in a way, is a real game changer. It, um, it brought hope, I suppose, for, for those impacted by the conflict, but also brought great interest from um, civic society, from individuals, because it refers to citizens. We had a discussion in our own house when that statement came out, where I'd said to my wife, would we take would we take a family in? We've got space in the house. Would we, would we bring a, a refugee family in? Um, and, and we probably would, uh, I suppose. Um, and I know others are having that discussion and our clients have been in contact to say, well, what does that mean? UK companies can sponsor individual Ukrainians. Um, what, do, what does that mean? What does sponsorship mean? Is it financial um, uh, offering that, that we make or... Is it a um, something more practical? And lots of businesses have been trying to get their head around what it means. It's not helped, I suppose, by the fact that when it comes to migration, businesses can already sponsor skilled workers to work for them. So the use of the word sponsorship has caused quite a lot of confusion. But but this was a really what I thought was a really positive um, announcement. We're now a, a week on, and maybe perhaps unsurprisingly, we're not really any further forward. Um, in terms of what that means. The, on the back of that statement, the Home Office had updated their website and we have that text on the, on the next uh, slide. And the, I think this is still, they keep chopping and changing, but I think this is still on the, the, the website where it says that the sponsorship scheme, and, and this is a quote from the website, I'll just read out the slide. It says, the scheme will allow sponsors such as communities private sponsors or local authorities to bring those forced to flee Ukraine to the UK. There'll be no limit in the scheme. We'll welcome as many Ukrainians 
as wish to come and, and have match sponsors. Those who come will be granted an initial period of 12 months and be allowed to work. So the work aspect is really important because it's, um, those who are claiming asylum to be going through the asylum process and uh, with a view to being recognised as refugees tend not to be allowed to work, even though some of them are very highly skilled. Some of them will have skills in shortage occupations. They're, they've never been allowed to um, to work, which is a, a bone of contention um, in in the, the refugee world um, or, or those working in the, in the refugee world, maybe even broader. But this um, guidance, which went out on the gov.uk website from the Home Office, really cements the Prime Minister's initial announcement that the sponsorship will be broad, so it will allow communities um, and private sponsors. So it reiterates this point that I as an individual or I as a and my wife as a family unit could sponsor um, the firm, the Burness Paul could potentially sponsor people. <clears throat> and then we go on to communities. So the, the initial thing I thought of was, uh, oh, th there'll be a role for the churches, for religious groups, for charities, um, for community associations to come together and uh, coordinate the sponsorship of, of re refugee families. And, and they've called it local sponsorship. Um, so again, a very different concept from anything that we've ever um, had before. And the, so far, we're very clear that, that there is a role for um, us as individuals if we want to and, and are able to, to help. Um, and there's a role for businesses, including our own firm, um, who are already making various efforts. We've, we've done what many other businesses have done. We've donated to some of the charity appeals in a financial sense. And, We've had collections across our uh, offices to, to, to send um, much needed goods to um, the Ukraine. But, but this looks like there's something more that we could all be doing and, and, and something that we might feel good giving money or we might feel good um, dropping um, goods off nappies and, and, and sleeping bags and the like at, at collection points. But this gives us something more and something more tangible. And, and, and so far, the the announcements to this stage um, have looked like um, we are ready for um, what commentators expect will be a very uh, drawn out conflict that's likely to, to deteriorate um, significantly in the Ukraine. We don't, the commentators don't think there's going to be a swift end to this and, and the numbers of people leaving the, the Ukraine are going to increase very significantly. And that's perhaps one reason why the uh, European Union have simply opened their uh, borders. And, and it's not, uh, interestingly for those who are lawyers, on the call, it's not just the Schengen zone that, that's opened up. So some EU countries uh, that are not Schengen countries, uh, Romania, I think, uh, is one, Croatia is another, maybe Cyprus. I can't remember if Cyprus are in the Schengen zone, but Romania and Croatia, but Romania obviously borders um, the, the Ukraine. So usually entry into Romania would not allow you entry to the rest of the Schengen zone. Um, but for these purposes, the, the EU have just opened all their, their borders. And, and our comparator here, I suppose, is Ireland, where Ireland have just opened their borders completely to anyone from Ukraine who wants to go there. And as Grace said, that's not an approach the UK government have taken. So these, these announcements and what's on the website and what's still there um, look good. But, but then we descend into... Um, a real arena of uh, confusion because of the various statements from different ministers. So there's, there's kind of, I gave up trying to do this slide because there's so many statements from so many different um, ministers that it became hard to follow. But the, the, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, said that she was investigating the legal options to create a humanitarian route. Um, I caught, I was in the office on Monday and uh, on in the drive-in, I was listening to um, Radio 4 in the morning and James Cleverly, who's a, the Europe minister, I think it's quite a competent minister, comes across well. Um, he was saying that there was no plans to, to what had happened over the weekend um, to earlier announcements. And he, he said that they'd already launched two schemes. Um, I then had to, pull over, <laughs> had to pull over the car and take to Google because I thought that they might have announced more to this um, the, this humanitarian sponsorship scheme uh, from the way he was he was speaking. Um, I thought they had already launched it over the weekend and I, I had missed it, but they hadn't 
So, but he had indicated that there were already two schemes in place, the family scheme that Grace has spoken about and the corporate sponsorship scheme that I'm, uh, that I'm speaking about. And then him and the interviewer focused on a third uh, humanitarian scheme. So I, I was completely confused, but, uh, but I think the, the Minister of Immigration is not his brief. Um, and, and the interviewer were working on the basis that this corporate sponsorship scheme was already opened. And on Monday, we saw another um, bunch of emails from clients asking about the scheme, presumably from people who had heard the, heard the programme in the morning. Um, uh, someone else, I think it might be the um, might be a Downing Street, uh, unnamed Downing Street official, then said, we've set out the details of the two routes that were putting in place. So that's the route Grace has spoken about and then the, the route that the last two slides have spoken about. And then the Prime Minister said, um, I think on Monday, um, that the sponsorship route is the humanitarian route. So I think there was confusion as to whether there were two or three routes, but the sponsorship route he's speaking about is the one that we looked at two slides ago, I think, that he announced in Poland. But there's additional confusion on the basis of whether the government are referring to the sponsorship route being the skilled worker sponsorship route that we deal with at, at the moment and that many of you will use to sponsor skilled staff, the old tier two, it used to be called the tier two route. Um, and that's that's traditionally called the sponsorship route. So the, the government have, um, whether uh, deliberately or otherwise, um, created um, a question as to whether what the Prime Minister is speaking about, a, a route that allows businesses and communities, charities to sponsor people is the sponsorship route that we already have, the skilled worker or the tier two route, um, or whether it's a new humanitarian route, as he indicated initially, and as the uh, government web pages now, now say. So I'm sorry that's a bit complicated, um, but that's, um, that's where we are. If we move on to the next slide, we, we can look at, um, if, if we work on the basis, I think that they're going to bring in a new route um, where businesses, families, individuals, and, um, and charities or community groups can sponsor people, then we, using our knowledge of, of how we deal with, ref, how we dealt with refugees previously, um, we, we we can get a better understanding of what the route might look like and, and what the policymakers are, are thinking. And when it comes to immigration, one of the things that I always say in seminars is, is that immigration is not a standalone policy area. Um, immigration is essentially a lever when it comes to industrial policy. Um, it's, it's a lever in relation to economic policy. In relation to some of what we'll see now, it's, um, it has aspects of security uh, policy within it. There's a real um, securitization of migration policy in, in, in recent years, which is, which is significant medium to long term. Um, and I suppose in the current environment that, that we're all in and where we've just come from, there's aspects of public health policy in relation to, to migration. Um, and from the UK, well, I should have said it's that I'm speaking about the government and mostly in the UK government because immigration policy is is reserved. Um, in a Scottish context, immigration is mostly spoken about in relation to population. So there's population policy and, and using migration as a, as a lever to to address our um, population challenges in, in, in this part of the, the country. Um, but the, these are all factors that will be relevant. And when, when I said that the, the scheme is very different from what we've done before, um, what I essentially mean is that um, this is the first time in my view since the Kosovo conflict that the UK has been active, um, or but at a very early stage, so not quite been active. It looks like we're going to be active in a very positive way. Um, and those of you who were around at, at, when, when Kosovo was, was having issues. Um, we remember that lots of Kosovans were brought to the UK from the conflict zone. Um, lots of families came here and 
that at the UK side was channeled through local authorities. Um, so the, the local authorities, the, the local councils uh, took families in, they found housing, they supported them, they worked with the education sector in terms of English language uh, training, they worked with uh, schools and then civic society community groups were secondary to that cost of an support effort. Um, and that, I suppose, is a well-established and maybe an easier model because the local authorities that took Kosovan refugees um, back in the in the 90s um, have that knowledge um, and have that ability. That there are those connections with social work teams and health teams and, and the like. The, the model comes back, it disappears after Kosovo for all the other conflicts, um, uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, Libya, Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, all the other countries that we as, as refugee lawyers have dealt with over the years. Um, it then comes back in a very, very limited way uh, and very late on in Syria, where they relocate very vulnerable people through the UNHCR, um, the, the refugee, UN's refugee agency. So um, there are um, local authorities that took um, very small numbers of Syrian refugees relocated from uh, the war zone there. And then the most recent model, uh, but again, the Syrian model is through local authorities. And then the most recent one um, is the Afghan resettlement scheme, where, where the government um, haven't, have plans for an Afghan resettlement scheme to bring vulnerable people from Afghanistan. I have a client, a medical professional whose, whose family are waiting in Pakistan in a refugee camp, but we're the best part of, we're, we're coming up to a year after, maybe less than that, um, nine months or so since the, we saw those scenes at, at the airport in Kabul. And this Afghan resettlement model is still not open. Uh, only in January there did, did they announce what the scheme would look like. They'd work with the UN Refugee Agency to, to transfer people over, but, but they've never opened the scheme uh, still. And I think that this is worth mentioning because there's a risk here that, that we spend the next 12 months speaking about a U Ukrainian humanitarian sponsorship scheme and, and it never actually uh, opens in, in the way that the Afghan scheme has, has never actually opened after the year. And I think the government are now saying that they'll look at Afghanistan, look at open it and have an operational by spring. Um, but I, I suspect that the attention will be off of Afghanistan and maybe onto the Ukraine. But, but that will have been a year and, and there's no further forward from all the very positive policy announcements. If we move on to the, to the next slide, um, there are lots of practicalities for one, the state, the government to be thinking about, and two, for, um, uh, for us to be thinking about in terms of what approach we will take or we as a business community will take. Um, should a sponsorship scheme open. And I know there's some local authorities on the call um, today. So the question of accommodation and support is, is one that's come up. So again, James Cleverly, the Europe Minister, um, and I think maybe even the Prime Minister himself um, have said, um, we're not going to do what the EU has done is just open the borders and let everyone in because uh, there are questions as to how we support people and how and where they're accommodated. So. The EU have taken a very different approach. They've opened the borders and they, they'll sort accommodation and support out for those who need it. UK government are very clear that they want to have a plan uh, in, on that front um, before they open any scheme. So that's a massive task. And, and, and that's where the, the question about matching families or matching refugees is going to come in. There is an issue that no one's talking about and no one's mentioned, but it, but it will be a concern to policymakers about how they avoid exploitation. Um, and that could be explo exploitation of people within the labour market um, um, uh, and employment practices, or it, it, it could be other forms of, of, of exploitation um, because the people coming will be vulnerable. Um, there's a question over whether the refugees that come will be mostly elderly women and children be because um, Ukraine imposed martial law. Um, and I think the whatever border controls they have are, are asking or preventing males between 18 and 60, I think, or 65 from um, leaving the country they're expected to stay and, and fight. So um, so we, we could see a proportion of very vulnerable people coming in. There's a question over how any system that's put in place 
deals with uh, with vulnerable people and, and we as businesses as, as we're thinking about how we will support humanitarian sponsorship um, we'll have to have that safeguarding issue in our in our minds and, and think that through because because there could be quite serious consequences um, if, if we get that wrong there's going to be an issue which the local authorities certainly in Scotland are, are very well used to uh, in terms of dealing with unaccompanied minors so children uh, who, who turn up by themselves. Um, we've traditionally always worked when, when we've done um, more refugee work with local authorities, social work departments. Um, there are good systems in place in many local authorities um, in, in Scotland, but not all are used to dealing with unaccompanied minors. Um, unaccompanied minors, young children coming themselves will probably be channeled through local authorities as opposed to charities, community groups, individuals, businesses. Um, sponsorship at the moment implies some sort of regime. Um, so to sponsor staff, you have to have a sponsor license. You have the, one of the bread and butter issues that we deal with is helping businesses uh, obtain sponsor licenses to sponsor staff and then help them maintain those licenses and deal with all the compliance aspects to it. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved and in terms of applying for the license, you have to put an employer's limited liability insurance, you know, 5 million, not 2 million. You have to put in bank statements, leases of your, your premises. You have to put in audited accounts. So there's a lot of paperwork involved in, in obtaining a license. The, the question is how, if the UK government are, are opening a, a, a sponsorship scheme how they're going to deal with the bureaucracy of people applying for licenses. And it could be um, community groups, it could be charity groups, um, it could be businesses like ours. So, or, or it could be families, private individuals as, as a guidance. Say. So how are, how are they going to uh, introduce that sponsoring aspect? What checks are, are going to be done on people? And I'm thinking back to the exploitation aspects, what criteria are there? And how are they going to manage the volume of, of people coming forward to, to help? So, so these are all questions that I guess the UK government will be, will be grappling with. And then the, the model that I wondered uh, whether they would go down the route of is um, having organisations, established organisations like uh, churches or mosques, religious groups, temples, synagogues, um, having very well established groups and, and established employers coordinate on behalf of their employees or, or congregations and, 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 and that's where the matching uh, process might come in. It would have been much easier for them to do it through local authorities. I'm not sure local authorities, if, if we're thinking of significant numbers, will be able to deal with it by themselves, um, but, but bypassing local authorities or, or opening it out with local authorities comes in, opens all these issues. And, and it could be that we end up in a model where businesses are asked to coordinate um, their staff taking in refugees or refugee families. Um, but that is for speaking uh, uh, from an employer viewpoint, that gets us into a really complex area about well, where is accountability? So it could be I say, okay, I'll, we'll take a family in our house, um, but we can't afford the additional costs and it might be the employer um, supplements that in, in some way. So, so that's a plausible model where there's some sort of accountability from, from the, the refugees coming in. But the real challenge on that um, is the, the question of from an employer around things like exploitation or support uh, or well-being, um, how, where, where is the relationship there? I think that's a really complex issue but I'm not saying that that's where we're going to get to. If we move on to the, the next slide which is my uh, final slide I think um, from an employer viewpoint you can simply wait and see what happens but but as the Afghan uh, relocation program shows that we could have a very long wait and be no further forward anytime uh, soon. The, the the alternative is to look to sponsor people under the existing sponsorship regime, and that's the, um, the scheme that we would call the tier two regime, which is now called the skilled worker. 
regime. And I saw yesterday one really significant um, tech sector business. I think the Goffs is in Edinburgh, maybe Glasgow as well. Um, I should know because we, I think we act for them. Um, they, um, they are, there are a handful of bigger companies advertising roles aimed at um, Ukrainian skilled workers. Um, so the, the job advert, or one of the job adverts that I've seen so far says that we will fast track applications from Ukrainian nationals and we will sponsor you. So there, there is the ability to sponsor under existing uh, visa rules for skilled workers. So that's jobs that are at the right salary level, that are at the right skill level, um, et cetera. And that's for um, sponsors who already have a sponsor license. Um, there are going to be very practical issues with that because the, the people that um, those businesses are seeking to sponsor are not inside the UK at the moment. So they have to apply for a visa to come and uh, all the visa application centres, as Grace noted on, uh, uh, touched on from uh, Paris to Moldova, um, are all at standstill. There's no availability of appointments for people to be uh, fingerprinted and the like. So even if you identify talent or, or skilled people that you are willing to offer a job to and you have a sponsor license and certificates of sponsorship to do that, there are very practical challenges around those visas being, being processed. One thing employers might want to think about doing is if you do not have a sponsor license and, and you're keen to do something um, to help, then it could be that you think about obtaining a uh, a sponsor license and that's the existing sponsor license this could be completely different from the humanitarian sponsorship regime that comes out but i wonder as well whether those employers with existing sponsor licenses and that will include corporates charities sports clubs and, and the like um whether there'll be some sort of dispensation for them given that they've already been through a series of suitability checks from the government um there are going to be challenging dynamics around English language. So at the moment, anyone coming as a skilled worker usually has to have passed an English um, test. They, uh, for nationals of Ukraine, interestingly, I don't think people know this, but um, every Ukrainian national who comes to the UK on a visa, other than a short-term visitor, um, has to register with the police. So uh, as do Russian nationals, Chinese nationals, and various other, various other nationalities. Um, so there, there's been no changes to the police registration rule. So um, unless that changes, um, those of you who work with um, uh, police forces or, or police authorities um, will need to be ready and, and, and for a, a, a significant number of new registrations on that front. The other thing that goes in here is TB, tuberculosis testing. So anyone from the Ukraine coming to the UK on a visa, again, the same with Russia requires to do a TB test, but in the guidance that was published yesterday in relation to the section that Grace spoke on, um, they, the government have said that they would dispense with TB testing um, for Ukrainians coming here and, and have consulted with the um, UK um, Health Security Agency in, in that regard. But I mentioned police registration, English language and, and TB testing because they are still, to an extent, barriers. Um, not so much police registration, so that's something that's dealt with when people arrive, but TB testing and English language testing have not been taken away, I don't think, in relation to um, skilled sponsorship under the, the existing routes for new people coming. That might change. Um, there's an issue in terms of the labour market and the dynamics of that, in terms of, I suppose that links into population, if we get an influx of um, people coming to, to the UK. Um, and if, 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 if the doors are open the way Ireland has opened the doors, albeit in a more or a significantly more limited way, um, could that create opportunities for sectors where there are sh a shortage of either skills or uh, labour? And I think there, there might be too much optimism on that front, given the dynamics of the people who are likely to um, come over and the challenges that they will have um, in dealing with uh, trauma, the trauma of war that always comes with, with war. Um, 
and we certainly see that in communities where there's an act of war or um, civil significant civil unrest still going on back home, the communities find it hard to turn their minds fully to um, to what's happening here. Um, and plus the issue that I already mentioned about martial law being imposed and um, healthy um, males of fighting age being not being permitted to leave. So the labour market issue is something that people are talking about a lot, seeing this as a um, as a, a method of dealing with the the loss of the free movement and, le- and unskilled, low skilled labour on the back of that. But but I think that's overhyped in the short term, medium to long term. That 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 might be something that we look at more. And then I suppose the question for businesses at the moment is um, what are you ready to commit to? And, and I, I think now if you're having discussions at board level or, or, or amongst yourselves, um, this question of what kind of support are we ready to, to give? Are, are we happy to refugees? Um, so I don't mean the, the work that you're already doing in terms of support and collections or, or, or the like, but if there were to be a corporate sponsorship scheme, which the government have announced that there will be, um, what support would you be willing to give? Maybe you'd be happy to coordinate um, the placements, as it were, placements for one of the better phrase amongst your uh, your staff, or would you prefer to simply say, well, we're not going to get involved ourselves, but we will donate to um, community groups or, or others who are, who are doing it, but we're not going to get involved ourselves, or is there an, at, uh, an appetite um, or a need? There might well be a need, given the, the volume, uh, for you to step up to, to the plate and do something more in practical terms. So um, that's that's end of my session. I'm afraid I don't have any answers, um, but those are just some um, thoughts on where we think the scheme could go, some of the challenges which might account for the um, for, for for the delay. Um, someone's asked a question there that I might just take before we move on about, can you say more about what community sponsorship might mean? Um, do they have to have a job identified or a sum, sum of money set aside? I think no in, in the short term. I think, I think what they're thinking in terms of community sponsorship is that... Um, I think the easy model to explain it is maybe church groups. A church, a church might say, okay, we will take five families and we will find somewhere for them to stay and, and we will financially support them. You could have a boxing club or something uh, say the same. There, there are well-established refugee groups, um, are mostly around the central belt, um, who already do this with failed asylum seekers, um, as it were, and it might be uh, the government looking to tap into that type of goodwill. I don't think we're going to be in a very formal scenario where um, a community group or or an employer business um, has to have a job that someone can do to sponsor, uh, to be able to sponsor, because because that defeats the purpose in a way, because you think of people coming, if if you take a a, a traditional family of kind of a mother, a father and, and some children, then the, the people leaving are likely to be the um, um, the mother and the children, as it were. And I know it's more complex than that, but I'm just thinking of the, the prohibition on, on people leaving has been on males, I think, of, of working. Age. So I don't think the government would then ask um, people to, to, to come over. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Louisa, I know that you've raised a question there. We'll come back to you on the, uh, the Q&A chat, if, if you don't mind. I'm just conscious of time. Um, and I'd like to pass over uh, to David Morgan, uh, please, of the um, employment team. Thank you, Grace, and to Jamie. Um, so most of the questions I think that we are getting and we anticipate getting are going to be around the immigration side of things and indeed global global working. And really, as Jamie says, some really weighty moral, I take from your presentation, uh, Jamie, as well as legal issues there. Um, But there there will be other issues and other ways, I think, that the HR community, so for those of you uh, on the HR side in in the group today, will be asked to support employees. So just a few words from me, really, to conclude on the employment law side of things. Um, And I I think for me, it probably is mostly about mental health. Uh, The the, the volume has really turned up, has it not, on mental health issues at work generally uh, since the pandemic, um, lockdown, isolation, loneliness, worry about finance, health, 
family, childcare, juggling issues and fear of uh, the safety and health of uh, elderly relatives, while all the while some employees found themselves working harder than ever before. Um, and here now we scroll ahead and look what we're seeing on the on the screen, the scenes of war unfolding, the like of which many of us have never seen before and never imagined that we would ever see again uh, in Europe. So we've got people thinking, are we going to see uh, troops, um, UK troops sent? Uh, will our own country be attacked? Will there be a nuclear attack? It's all incredibly upsetting um, and scary. And, and personally, having a, a teenage son who is... Uh, fascinated by history at school and World War II in particular, um, and equally someone of that generation who is very well tuned in to the information overload on social media, I can relate to the anxiety that I see that this causes um, with all that we're seeing um, unfolding. Um, so concern about this tragedy is understandable, um, but employers should also be aware that for some employees and some workers, that level of stress and anxiety could just trip over such that we will need um, to support, uh, whether with active help or indeed with time off work. Um, and we all know mental health, as I say, the agenda has greatly uh, increased in, in recent time. It's OK to talk about mental health issues at work. And actually, it's actively encouraged. It's OK to not be OK, as the saying goes. And that's something I think that we've really all embraced um, through the pandemic in particular. Now, it's hard, of course, I think a key message I would say, which is hard when some of us like um, myself working from home here, we're moving back into a, a hybrid way of working in the office as well. But I think a key takeaway for me is that it's, it's more important than ever to have a, an open doors policy, to be available um, for your employees, not to shut away from these difficult issues um, and to let people feel comfortable and have a safe space to come forward and talk if they're feeling upset, if they're feeling uh, concerned or indeed traumatized. Um, a saying I always think with the, the difficult work we do on employment law side is in, in, in difficult times, the rule is to over communicate. So over communicate with your people, talk about these issues, just as we've been doing in the course of this morning. Um, so just to, to a few tips, I suppose, in addition to the um, immigration aspects, what more uh, can HR do to help? Um, I think firstly, identify uh, who is most at risk. Um, there'll be UK employees impacted because they're Ukrainian or from uh, Ukrainian heritage. Uh, they may have family, friends and colleagues who are still in the country. Um, similarly, there may be Russians, Russian colleagues in the UK who may, or, may fear reprisals as well as individuals um, without a direct connection. Uh, but who are affected by the war and its implications. So I'm thinking, therefore, being alive to the risks of overly politicized language uh, in the workplace and at worst, how, where that might even trip over into bullying and harassment um, on racial grounds. So being alive to that from an HR perspective. And secondly, and Jamie touched on this, I think probably the first thing that we see and have seen in the reaction to the, to the humanitarian crisis um, is that people want to help. And they want to support, they want to get behind charities and organizations. HR, I think, probably is the home where you'll be reached for first to look at how that can be coordinated, whether it's collections, as we've done as a firm that Jamie mentioned. Um, and that might just be the first response that for people that want to help, they can get behind a good cause and feel better about it in themselves for having done so. So that can certainly, as we know, go a long uh, way to, um, uh, to assisting with the mental health challenges. Um, I saw a great term in, in a piece I was reading but called doom scrolling. Avoid doom scrolling on social media. I'm glued to it personally, I have to confess. Um, but actually taking a break from that, taking a pause from just constantly looking at the 24-7 uh, the, the updates that we see with all that's going on. Um, and I know there's been much through pandemic of uh, support to workers, whether it's workshops, whether there's yoga, mindfulness, these types of sessions. But, you know, I think as we've moved through the pandemic, there's nothing more than just giving employees a break. Um, an organization that I heard used what a term called well-being hours, just giving employees a well-being break rather than loading into your diary with more uh, training sessions and, and more updates. So just that pause to take a step back might be the way to go. Um, and ultimately, of course, support for mental health and well-being. I think that is um, central to all of this. ACAS has a view on it. ACAS says that, listen, there's no legal obligation to provide employees with counselling. 
but we're seeing employers that are prepared to do that. And ACAS, of course, encourages it. They mention charities like Mind and NHS Every Mind Matters, you know, to look at giving a list of that type of support externally uh, where you might um, assist. And in larger organisations, of course, there might actually be active counselling uh, that's offered. Um, so really, in, in, in summary, to conclude, it's good to talk, keep that channel of communication uh, open, having conversations about these real world issues and educate the workforce to look for signs of stress in others. Um, you know, this, as I say, it's OK not to be OK. Ask some of they're OK. Um, but I saw a great piece on TV that said, well, don't just ask if they're OK. Ask, are you really OK? So look for signs um, where people may be under particular pressure by all that's going on, as well as, of course, the impact of the uh, Ukraine situation. Um, support to managers and HR. Many of you may have seen a piece I put out during lockdown to the HR community, which I coined. It's oh, uh, who looks after the people who look after the people. So remembering that there's support needed for the managers, support needed for leadership teams and indeed, of course, the HR community, because it's a lot for you guys to take on um, when ultimately you are looking to support the people um, that others report into. Um, and finally, I think just reminding people of the resources that are aware uh, that are available to them. Um, many organizations of scale will have employee assistance programs. Uh, many of those will provide free counseling services um, as well as mental health benefits um, for employees. So while trite perhaps, just being mindful to offer that and to remind staff uh, that those opportunities um, are uh, there and available to them. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, much appreciated. Um, one point I thought I would maybe come back to you on, uh, Jamie, you touched on um, the dispensation in respect of the TB testing. Um, and obviously you touched on uh, overall healthcare uh, issues and policies that may well come into place. Has there been any discussion regarding COVID? No, there's not, there's not been any, as far as I'm aware, I've not seen any policy the discussions on uh, the, the vaccination status of, the, of those coming in. Um, but I think from a public health viewpoint, the government are obviously alert to the public health issues and, and are speaking to the uh, professionals in relation to uh, TB testing. But I, I suspect it'll be another factor that's, that's considered, but I've not seen anything on, on the vaccination status of those coming in or the, or the requirements for people to be vaccinated. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Does anybody else have any questions? Just conscious that we've just about reached our time. As I said earlier, Jamie and I are very happy to pick up offline with anybody um, who's got some direct questions, particularly for family members or friends. Um, and I think there's a, a couple of points being raised on the chat box uh, and forum so far. So please, of course, reach out to us. We'll do what we can. Um, we may not have the answers given the um, the sparse information and confusing information that's out there, but um, we'll certainly do our best to try and get answers for you uh, and to help. And obviously the situation is evolving day by day and um, we may look to come back in you know, a week, two weeks time with an update uh, webinar for you um, and you'll be uh, notified of that from uh, the usual mailing lists. So thank you very much everybody. Thanks to David and to Jamie. Thank you.